Apologist Dr. James White accuses Rand of black supremacy. Exactly what is ethnic Gnosticism? And is confronting racial ignorance divisive? We'll talk about that and more on this episode of The Urban Perspective. Here and I'm excited to be here with pastor, historian, scholar, YMCA, EVP, uh, homiletical hero, friend, and Cynthia's boo, uh, James go. White. Thank Let's you so much. Thank uh, you for joining us for the here. Urban Perspective. Uh, really honored to have you. Really, really yes. honored for you to be on the show and to discuss some of these things uh, today. Well, I just want to hop right into it. Okay. Uh, you and I both were able to view a video by apologist James White. We have entered into a time period where if you stand for the biblical teaching that the definitional lens through which every Christian in every nation of every ethnicity and every skin tone is to look at Scripture, at the world around us, at history, and at each other in the fellowship of the faith is solely and only the cross of Jesus Christ and nothing else. Or if you stand for that, you are being marginalized. You're being told you're wrong. Have you seen a pattern in those within evangelicalism that don't allow themselves to be challenged or be in the position of, uh, of a student rather than a teacher? You know, it's, it's interesting, Jerome. And first of all, man, I'm excited to be here and, and thankful for who you are as a leader, who you are as a thought leader, and really thankful for some of the things you're doing even with this platform and this forum. Now, it's interesting that we're talking about James White. I think right. it needs to be clear, <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's been, it's been humorous right. how yeah. people have even confused the two of us. Now, I was offended with one, uh, someone said in one tagline that we look alike. I was a little bit offended by that. So both of us are bald-headed glasses and bow ties. Uh, and, and while I know that that's sort of the catalyst to our conversation, I think it's real important that really the issues that we're going to be talking about today are a lot larger than James White. Absolutely. Uh, and a lot larger than the James White, the apologist, and even a lot larger than me. That some of these issues are sort of embedded within the framework and fabric of really how we've been journeying now for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for us maybe to not fall into some of the things that we often do today to where it's almost as if we're doing a battle. Uh, there is really no battle uh, with James White, the person. Absolutely. I think part of the challenge is though these are ideas that we continue uh, to struggle with uh, even today. And so this, this whole issue, and it's interesting the words that you use when you say words of confront, uh, words of disagreement. Well, those words automatically causes people's brains to, to move in the defensive. Absolutely. And, and, and I think part of it is, is when we get to the place to where we can't be critiqued. And, and I think this is where, once again, our belief in Scripture and our belief in the Bible that really talks about our even limitations as humans. Uh, this is where this idea of humility comes in, it, not idea, but reality that we have. And this is where, man, our God has to be incredibly big. And, uh, if, yes. and, and if God is who he is, then any of us in our thoughts and ideas can be critiqued. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, and even when I was watching the James White, uh, his podcast, Sometimes all of us can do this. We use rhetorical devices that are very subtle, that really allow us not to have a conversation, but a mm -hmm. one-way dialogue. Yeah. And so all too often, I think, whenever you bring up this issue or these issues, there's an automatic defensiveness because it really does take, I believe, the power of God to listen. 
I, I think that's why you often will see in scripture this idea of he who has ears to hear, let him hear, because listening is very, very difficult. So I think there has been a pattern. That's, that we've seen all throughout our history of it's difficult for us to listen to people with points of views who are very different than we are, especially people where we don't understand, again, yeah. their, their story. Yeah, Yo, that's good. That's good. And I, and I thank you for pointing that out because the point of this is not to be combative, right. uh, but to be compelling. Yes. Um, as he as he continued, I think you know it's, it's important for us as Christians to be able to have healthy dialogue, yes. to be able to disagree and even yes. disagree yes. in love. As he continued, he talked about an organization called LDR. And there's a there's an article that says a request for our white participants. Dear brothers and sisters, thank you for registering to join us for LDR weekend. We truly look forward to welcome. You to our family reunion, please take a look at the event schedule as you make your plans. Uh, the LDR organizing team would like to ask our white brothers and sisters to dedicate one seminar, uh, seminar hour to anti-racism training. Um, only, only whites need to have anti-racism training? Well, according to this, evidently. Only whites can experience racism. Uh, he then kind of went on a diatribe uh, to assume that they were saying that, you know, blacks didn't need this training. Um, you know, ha have you kind of seen that where we know that sin can take on any form and it can uh, obviously come in uh, any color? But, but it seems like when black and brown people want to talk about it with amongst white evangelicals, again, not painting all of them with one broad stroke, but saying that these are issues that black and brown people are facing. So here's why we would ask you to attend maybe some training to, to learn from our, our struggle and our experiences. Why do you think conversations like that are either sidestep or critiqued as being divisive and not gospel-centered? Yeah, well, well, I think it's, it's interesting because what we, what many times, many of my white brothers and sisters don't realize is that they have taken the conversation to the same place as those who come from a framework that does, they don't have the gospel, who are not looking at this through, quote unquote, as we say, a gospel lens. Because yeah. when you look at this through a gospel lens, then certainly no one should ever push back on any kind of experience that's going to help you understand a people group who right. need to right. encounter the gospel. And so if, if really the goal is really to carry out the great commission of all nation, all people group, then why would one even sort of recall back and even saying you need to, because I think the challenge becomes, it's a subtle challenge. The challenge becomes when sometimes when you're white, and I'm using the word white rather than majority culture uh, okay. in our conversation. I think okay. sometimes we want to soften how we talk about this. No, we're talking about white people. Uh, and, but sometimes what happens is when you hear those kinds of statements, even for a conference to say, White people must attend this particular seminar. Well, that goes against the way our brains are wired as mm. white people. Because, wow. especially for those of us of white, conservative, evangelical Christians, and even beyond it, just white Christian, period, we're not used to hearing words of authority come from a particular group. Because that's changing hundreds of years of yeah. how we even gather and collectively right. engage together. That goes culturally against the brain that this group that does not have authority socially, economically, politically, now all of a sudden are going to say, you must go to a wow. particular seminar. So some of it is even us being able to wrap our minds around submitting to authority mm. that is authority for people of color. That's a difficult thing to do. Yeah. So would you say, uh, again, not all whites, but no. would you say that many or some, let's say some, between some and many, uh, have a sense of entitlement and then therefore get defensive when black and brown place a certain, res place a certain restriction upon them? Right. I, I think it's, it's the authority thing I think is important because I think 
even by virtue of the way we are educated. And the, the, I'm going to use some very simple pictures. So, for example, if we were to go into any Christian bookstore, then we might think that there is no authority that comes from African American or Hispanic voices. When you look at the majority of the books that yeah. we read, and when, when you look at again the mark, when you when you look at our educational system, when you look at the number of professors that you're going to experience in in conservative seminaries that many of us would go to, well, your learning experience, your reading experience, even your visual experience. If we look online and we begin to ask who are the real teachers today. Uh, you will have to think of only a few African-American names. So there's this assumption, there's an assumption of authority mm -hmm. that is a cultural assumption that it takes a great deal of intentionality not to think that way. So there's yeah. an assumed authority when you look at who we read, when you look at who we study, when you look at who we listen to, when you look at all of those things. And so I think authority is a given. And it's hard for people to yeah. even wrap their, because it's such a given. It's like the air we breathe in yeah. many ways, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, he then kind of launches into uh, Jamar Tisby. Jamar Tisby wrote an article on RAND, Reformed African American mm -hmm. Network, called The Downside of Integration for Black Christians. Before he addressed that article, he talked about a black woman who said that uh, black people can't be racist because they don't have access to power. Uh, how would you speak to that comment, just that in of itself? Because I, I mean, I, I agree that sin can be, you know, right. black people can exhibit that form of sin. But can you just speak to that mindset, kind of where that comes from? Right, and, and again, I, I would say, I mean, I would hope that Christians would have a much more, a, a much more thoughtful response rather than simply responding to this one antidote. Right. That comes from someone who who really not sure what worldview she espouses, mm -hmm. but when you pick an antidote and then you base a whole argument, then you're yeah. doing the very thing, which is interesting because whereas there were parts of the time period when I was listening to Dr. White where he was saying we can't judge everybody by one race, absolutely. But yet in that situation, he he, he went into conversation and identifying by this one particular statement. Yeah. So I think we, we, we miss sort of the cultural dynamic that exists, a historical dynamic that exists in America because absolutely there's a global narrative, which he pointed to, that people of all different ethnic groups have oppressed other people. When yeah. you look historically, yeah. absolutely, that case is true. But we're talking about here in the U.S. Right. And here in the U.S., <laughs> yeah. we've got to do our historical research and even understand, because I think the other thing that is often done, and this isn't what you asked, but I think this is a part of it, is the whole concept of race, absolutely it's a sociological construct. Absolutely it was invented. Uh, even in the very framing of the country, we often want to attribute it to the 1600s because up until the 1600s in the framing of America, we did identify people by religion and by class. Yeah. But in many ways, the subtle seeds of it started in the very beginning when Columbus first came here to the Americas. Because in the very beginning, the narrative begins to be rewritten because now you find these people, but they're not people. They're really not really here. And so we've come up with different systematic ways of really dehumanizing people. Yeah. And so that idea of the dehumanization of people has followed on through in the framing of America. Now, why one would say that black people can't be racist is because of that historical thread many times that exists. So in the very framing of America, you have the other, you make you otherize, you make them the other, you dehumanize people. Then you come up in the 1600s and 1700s, and you literally have the Virginia House of Burgess. And so you're creating laws mm -hmm. and everything that defines that white people can have this. And so you define what is white. You do that throughout history. You have a homestead act. You give land. You, mm -hmm. you literally provide resources, but you have to be a white person. 
Then you even see that going back in the beginning of the slave system as it's established here, when the first three escaped indentured servants that took place, uh, two of them received only a year extra of their servitude, but I believe his name is John Punch that received servitude for the rest of his life. And he happened to be a black person. And so you have this false narrative of whiteness that's created. 1700s, I know I'm giving you a lot. No, it's 1700s, you. you go into Blumenbach, Johann Blumenbach, who comes up with this science and the science of the oid, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, and Negroid. And Blumenbach comes up with this idea that people based on science are inferior. Then you even look at our founding fathers and you read the Jefferson, mm -hmm. the Virginia Papers by Thomas <laughs> right. Jefferson. And you yeah. see Jefferson's ideas that came from Blumenbach and other false science, bad science, that suggested that black people or these people who were enslaved are inferior people. And so you have this, I, these ideas that are built within the very fabric and framing of the country that even go on to the 1890s of our Supreme Court. Well, you got Dred Scott before that, that that says that black people, even if you're in a free state, you still can be owned. You're not free. Mm -hmm. That's still pointed to the dehumanization of people. Then you got 1890s and you got Plessy versus Ferguson, which now begins to set up racial categories. Well, the authorities that did that was America and the authorities that did that was white America. And right. that framing is in our educational right. system, our government. 1954, Brown versus Board of Education is supposed to strike down Plessy versus Ferguson. So this whole false construct was created within the fabric and framing of our culture that exists even today. 1969, you even have a Harvard uh, scholar who talked about race and inferiority of races. 1994, you've got the science of the bell curve and that science that said yeah. inferior. So you're talking about science that is accepted throughout our culture. So this isn't just some false idea or narrative by a few French people. This is within the fabric and building of who we are as a people in a country. And here's what's challenging. The church, which know that Genesis chapter 1 is true, that he created them male and female in the image of God. He created so we didn't bring the Imago Day, the church, throughout all those hundreds of years. Absolutely. Thank so you. Christians, when yeah. talking about this, should have a special humility in many ways, because the reason why the whole racial construct, which isn't real, exists, I would dare to say, is because my Christian brothers and sisters did not lift up the Imago Dei. Right, right. And that's why people have a hard time. Yeah. Even in hearing our voice, because we created sort of the complexity that, that again, James White speaks to. We created that complexity, the church. And I say we, because I am not going to disassociate myself, even from the horrific, ignorant, slaveholding, Past of my brothers and sisters. I'm not, because again, I know this is where total depravity comes in. The cross means, man, we got an ugly past. And in humility, yeah. <laughs> in humility, then yes, that's a part of my journey. But all the more reasons why Christians should be able to talk about this without defense. Because the cross allows us to look truthfully in our past. Right. And Christians have to own that the complexity of race and all of this conversation really lies at our doorstep because of both our science, our silence, but even our intentionality of developing systems and structures that even would cause society to think that certain groups of people, again, are less than, less intelligent because of race. I mean, our theological yeah. institutions. Yeah feel right in line with what the rest of society say. Well, thank you so much, man. That that was huge because typically uh, the, the, the distinction I see between how many black and brown process race, racial insensitivity and racial injustice is we look at it systemically. Whereas our white brothers and sisters, not all but many, look at it individually. And that seems to be what James White did 
in his mischaracterization of Jamar Tisby's article because right. Jamar was just simply talking about just being in this system to where we can't necessarily express ourselves or feeling uncomfortable. Feeling uncomfortable isn't divisive. He's talking about how he feels. Yes. And being a African American within the PCA in terms of his testimony and, and seeing some of these things, it seems like James White began to mischaracterize not only the article, but even Jamar himself. Right. When Jamar is speaking from personal experience, right. which can't not be debated. Right. These are things that he's experiencing. You had over 19 years. With, let, me, let me go back uh, to something, okay. because I think since you're mentioning names, it's important even to see the complexity of this, even in that conversation, because you're right. And here's what's painful for me mm -hmm. when I see Christian brothers, whether that's James White, uh, Dr. James White, and I just want to make sure, because I'm using my name. Mm -hmm. We're <laughs> talking is, about another James White. We're talking about another James <laughs> White, because yeah. some viewers may not be familiar with the take. Yeah, and, and I just want to make sure we're clear. But here's what's unfortunate: when we end up not, not being sensitive to a person's story, mm -hmm. just the fact that Jamar Tisby is one of the strong reform voices is incredible. When you take a look at again the history of what the reform, what those who have been reformed have done in our country. So just the work that Jamar has had to do to even be this incredible voice for reform is, is incredible. Yeah. So I think for, for James White to sort of almost turn him into, because of, because of some of the things he said, to sort of put him into this category that is so negative is very unfortunate because in that same podcast, James White talked about how he would be offended if someone put him in a category in light of his apologetics and defending the African-American story when it came to black Israelites and black Hebrews. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's funny how we do the right, same thing right. to people yeah. that we know would hurt us in yeah. many ways. So I just think, and this is where it's dangerous sometimes when we have the public voice, uh, when we have social media, sometimes it's dangerous to, to critique without that humility of even Absolutely. looking at ourselves. Absolutely. I don't know if that makes sense. No, nah, that makes perfect sense, and that's a great segue because in the story he was talking about certain experiences yes. that he has experienced yes. and that many black and brown yes. people experience yes. in predominantly white circles. Yes, absolutely. It was not a demonization of white people, white culture. In fact, he, DeMoss says in an article, integration is not the issue. Right. He also goes on to say that to try to get away permanently would be sinful. Right. And so, but he was talking about his individual experience. Right. You uh, spent 19 years with Campus Crusade. Yes. You know, as a black man in that predominantly white organization. Can you share just uh, share some of your stories and, and how you can kind of relate to some of the things that Jamar shared? Yeah, I, I can. And I would say once again, and I think uh, what Jamar is, is trying to say, and, and Jamar and I have never had an in-depth conversation, but really it is even bigger than his current circumstances, and that's what I realized as well. Uh, even in, in my whole story, for a number of years, because again, of sort of experiencing it, and this is where it's even larger than Campus Crusade, uh, because one of the tools, again, Campus Crusade, love that gave me a real understanding of initiative evangelism and also evangelism that is very clear. Uh, again, I came during the time period of the four spiritual laws and, and the linear logic of that really spoke to, to my mind of really understanding some dynamics of the gospel. And then also from the D. James Kennedy model, evangelism explosion, which there are these two questions, the Kennedy questions, uh, when did you place your trust in Christ? And then where again uh, would you spend eternity? Those two questions were critical. And so for many believers, a number of years, they had a pride when they can give the date. And I used right. to always, when I would give my testimony, uh, for many years used to say it was 1979, 3.30 uh, in the afternoon, October 17th, Belt Dorm, 309C, <laughs> wow. on the left-hand side of the room. I was wow. in my book. I could yeah. give you the date and yeah. time. And I used to be excited, just like, you know, you're laughing. But then the older I got and began to fully embrace my story, it, it brought a sadness. And here's why it brought a sadness. Because I'm negating all of the work that was done in Good Hope Amy Zion Church. Mm. In Good Hope Amy Zion Church, 
even though there was not a framework of these four principles, every Sunday we said the Apostles' Creed. Well, if I believe in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the universal church, I believe, every Sunday I was quoting the gospel. Uh, in good old baby Zion church, it was, it was also, again, Mrs. Seymour in her Sunday school class. We weren't talking about any liberal theories. <laughs> it was talking about Jesus and Christ being the only way to God. Mm. In my church upbringing, every Sunday we would sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. That song has this incredible high view of who God is. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. When I think about the theological weight of what I heard and experienced in my childhood, all Campus Crusade did was maybe bring a little bit more clarity, but the gospel was given to me the within foundation was the, the foundation yeah. was yeah. laid. Yeah. So that I would even take time to listen to these two people from Campus Crusade that came by my door. And I think sometimes as African Americans, we don't tell our complete story. Yeah. And sometimes what ends up happening, and I saw this even in Campus Crusade, there's this, there's this negative view of those things that you don't realize and a negative view of those things that really deal with the definition and framing of who I am as an African American person. Well. That doesn't come forth, of course, that, but who I am is someone who God had a sovereign plan for me that went all the way back to Barco, North Carolina, and God used Reverend Greer, God used yes. Reverend Shields, my complete story. Sometimes organizations that frame things in their cultural context, in the majority cultural context, we in America don't know how to appreciate those stories that we haven't engaged with. And to the point to where even many African-Americans think, well, my story didn't begin until I intellectually began to understand some of the things mm, that were good. taught to me yeah. through, again, the presuppositions and other things that you experience in many good conservative evangelical experiences. And because what happens? We end up almost taking a Descartes approach. Descartes, coito ergo son. I think, therefore, I am. <laughs> Rather than, that's not biblical. <laughs> it's not we think uh, we love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, right. mind, and strength. We, we again, become doers of the word rather than hearers of yeah. the word. And yeah. so, so we sometimes miss that man, there was a gospel reality that maybe wasn't articulated the same way as you heard when you got involved with crew and with other yes, organs yes. or with Bible teaching churches. Well, we also got to understand that this is where history comes in. Well, maybe we didn't articulate it that way because seminaries that gave the clear framework were not allowing African Americans to even attend those yeah, schools. Absolutely. So, and again, historically, Mary McLeod Bethune, she wanted to go to a conservative school, was not allowed to was go. Allowed. Martin Luther King, the was story is told, mm -hmm. was not allowed. So, some of what you had in the black community with our language of liberalism and everything really came because, once again, those who were in power, yeah. which happened to be my white brothers and sisters who friend did not allow and so so for me I you have this esteem issue mm -hmm. you have this issue that you you and, and, and it's subtle I believe it's subliminal it's not intentional but whenever you go to a conference and you only see a few people who look like you not even necessarily just from up front but even in the audience mm -hmm. then you begin to get this subtle message when the first books that you read Again, if my first book that I read uh, when I was discipled, uh, the first autobiography that I read uh, was Jim Elliott's uh, In the Shadow of the Almighty. Incredible, powerful autobiography. But that's beginning to frame my thinking. So my first books were, again, the, the Elizabeth Elliott's book about her husband, Jim Elliott. Another book I read was Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Cost of Discipleship. So the first books that I began, all of the authors were white. And then, but then not complete stories. 
because if, if someone had told me that even, and again, I think his name is Reggie Williams, he's, he's got a book out called Black Bonhoeffer. Uh, if someone had told me that Bonhoeffer was influenced by a trip that he made yeah. to Harlem. Yes. Uh, in Abyssinia. Yes. Yes. If someone had told yeah. me that the power of the black church influenced yes. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And that's and where his he got the concept of cheap grace. And that's where he got the concept yeah. of cheap grace. Yes. Imagine what would have happened to this young 18-year-old African-American leader, but instead... Many African Americans have to learn things on their own, go to conferences that mm -hmm. are contextualized, and you end up feeling like that what I'm doing is not normal and everything else is normal. And you end up with a subliminally inferiority complex. Wow. And, and that, that inferiority complex because all the leaders you're exposed to. And then, and then the other thing that happens is you also begin to get the wrong view of power. And, and what ends up happening when you take the journey that I've taken, you may subtly begin to think that power resists an individual change. So because you're in that space and boy, everybody wants you to succeed, uh, you begin to hear messages like, man, you're different and man, you're <laughs> biblical, you're a great Bible teacher, you need to go and learn. And then one day, almost a Moses complex, we even had a term, you're the black Moses. You're going to be that person to go and reach your people and go back into your community and reach your people. Now we're going to educate you in contexts that have nothing to do with your people, but you're going to go back <laughs> and reach your people. And yeah. you end up with uh -huh. this, and you end up with this context that is just not even true. Because wow. never can one person, that's not even the gospel. Right. <laughs> the, the, gospel the, yeah. the gospel says transformation happens through a system. And, and that it's a system that is changed that will reach your people. When you see Acts chapter 2, at the end of Acts chapter 2, verse 40 on, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They went from yeah. house to house. Yeah. It says they sold their goods and met one another's need. You see a system that is created that is a kingdom system based on Jesus. I'm sorry, I'm getting excited. No, me, no, that's good. Let me calm it down <laughs> here for a moment. You see a system uh -huh. that is put in place, and yeah. that system, more than three 3,000 were added. And that system changes the world. The Apostle Paul is a planter of churches. He's planting systems. But what we do sometimes is we got involved in organizations thinking if we were the only one or because we were good teachers, mm -hmm. that's really going to bring the change. No, systems are the things that right. bring the change. Absolutely. And we've got to correct the system. Absolutely. And thank you so much. That that's that's huge because you spoke about power and in, J in Jamar's article he talked about lamenting, you know, black and brown unarmed people being shot by police. And what astonished me was James White read that quote, but then just said, This sounds like Black Lives Matter. We want spaces to lament when the next unarmed black person is killed by law enforcement. Now, this sounds to me like Black Lives Matter things, not biblical things. Now, if I lived in Chicago, then there would be a need in the local church in Chicago to be making sure that everybody, everybody, it doesn't matter what, Latino, Asian, doesn't matter, that everybody in my fellowship was kept safe. Because of the war going on there, primarily... Gang related. It's gang related. And unfortunately, in many cities in the world, it doesn't matter what color the skin is, as long as there's gangs, drugs, sex trafficking, in other words, sin, there's death. There's death. But bringing in this, oh, all of a sudden now law enforcement's the bad thing. He did not address the point of unarmed black and brown people being murdered. And they are murdered by people in positions of power. So he, he miscategorizes and puts Jamar on par with Black Lives Matter. But then he begins to sound like Sean Hannity. He gives Fox News talking points. He's not providing scripture or biblical emphasis for that, for that specific point. He does mention scripture, but not on this point. Can you talk to that? Why, why is the, the idea, the reality of police brutality, the fact that these things are happening, why are so many white evangelicals 
opposed to talking about this head on? Yeah, I, you know, I think for some, I don't think we realize the psychological impact of how we have journeyed as believers for hundreds of years, the psychological impact that it has on us. I, and, and this is where, and, and this is where conversations like this, when we go to defense mode, this is where I feel like we miss some of the power of who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. That one of the things that should make us different uh, as believers, and, and Andy Crouch does a wonderful job talking about uh, this in his latest book of, of strength, I think it's strength and weakness, but he does this concept of authority and vulnerability. And for some reason, one of the things that's difficult, the reason why we go to Fox News, the reason why we'll go to Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh, or other talking heads, and, is because we don't want to lose authority. And, and that gospel-centered people as well, we've always gotten in trouble when we think that authority rules the day. What makes gospel-centered people different is we say yeah, authority, but we serve a Savior who says authority with vulnerability. Yeah. And rather than us understanding that when there's conversations that come into play, then maybe this is time for us to be vulnerable. And so, man, I've got to vulnerably enter into this conversation about police. And rather than coming to the defense and blaming the group of people who are vulnerable, you know, who are being, again, murdered, rather than humanizing, whether it's Eric Garner and his family, whether it's Trayvon Martin being a teenager, whether it's Mike Brown being a teenager, rather than us vulnerably entering in, and vulnerably entering in, because we are a people that understands the value of life. Absolutely. We understand the sanctity of life. Again, because we believe people are created in the image of God. Rather than doing that, we immediately get afraid as white Christians and we move to the place of dealing with authority. Because we, we rather than dealing with the vulnerable, and knowing that if you deal with the vulnerable, it doesn't mean that you are against the authority, but the authority and vulnerability have to enter in together. So here's what I mean by that. What I mean by that is, is that when I understand vulnerability, then, and I understand biblically, that of course a policeman can shoot someone because of their bias. Right. Of course, being a policeman, being a white policeman in a predominantly black neighborhood in light of all the visual mental images in light of Madison Avenue, in light of the Hollywood that we as believers hadn't, trans, hadn't really helped change, in light of all the things that you see, the messages that you see, absolutely white policemen may be quick to shoot someone. But not because it's the right thing. But because, man, there's a vulnerability that maybe they haven't dealt with. Mm -hmm. and, and rather than us, we, we enter in immediately go to authority. Well, if he hadn't have been doing the crime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, that's, that's language of authority. And I'm not saying that, that we throw, because you got to have both right, of absolutely. them working together. You, you see this with Jesus. Jesus, again, he, he has authority, but he has vulnerability. Yeah. John 13. Yeah. He doesn't lose his authority. But he moves to a place of vulnerability. John 13, he takes off his garment. Yeah. He puts on a towel. He, exactly. Even in the act of doing that yeah. with his disciples, he's very vulnerable here to unclothe himself, put on a towel. So we go to washing the feet. But even the very act, Jesus is moving from authority to vulnerability. And then Jesus is engaging his disciples who would deny him, who would betray him. And he's washing feet. And what does he tell us? You ought to wash one another's feet. Do what do we do rather than us washing the feet of Mike Brown, rather than us washing the feet of those who are saying, look, we have no authority of those in black. We end up trying to place more authority yeah. rather than going in and serving. And what does the yeah. serving look like for many times for us who are whites and, and white Christians is it means I'm willing to be vulnerable to hear without defense. Hey, I'm willing to listen to your tears, even though there may be some thoughts and ideas that may be wrong. I'm willing to engage, but not just from authority of I got all the answers, here's why this happened, but we're willing to be vulnerable. That's, well. that's, that's, that's a brilliant response. You know, one, one of the things that amazes me are the hermeneutical and exegetical gymnastics 
that evangelicals play when it comes to topics like this. You know, yes. you know, him and others are. Uh, he he did another video where he said it's it's hard uh, to of uh, being a Calvinist. Well, Calvinists go by the tulip model. You know, total depravity, mm -hmm. unconditional election, limited atonement, ir irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. The T is total depravity. Total would mean all, right? right? So if, if we embrace the concept and the biblical reality based on Genesis 3 of total depravity, why would we limit that total depravity can come out in the form of a white man in a blue uniform with a gun? If we embrace this idea of total depravity, then we, we have to understand that police brutality, it's not the only issue, but it is an issue. And then even exegetically, when we look at Acts 16, it would appear that Paul was a victim of police brutality himself. Acts 16, 19, they don't find out later that he has dual citizenship after the slave girl is free and then her owners see that their, their chance of gain is gone. A crowd comes and the Bible says the magistrates, which can be translated into police, mm -hmm. they join in beating Paul. Oof. Now, Pastor White, Paul's response wasn't, this isn't a gospel issue. <laughs> Paul's response right. was when they right. tried to let him go silently, right. he said, no, you beat me publicly and some of the police beat him yes. and he demanded an apology. So why, why do you think, um, so that's scripture, yes. but why do you think we avoid even the biblical reality that the gospel is not social justice, but the outpouring of it, that, that the gospel itself isn't social justice, but it's a message of justice to spiritually oppressed people whom by grace through faith are set free in Christ, why do we want to label what the gospel sees as normative, and that's confronting injustice, why do we label that liberal? Why do we politicize biblical realities? Pastor, it's interesting you say that because I, I, I almost would guarantee that even, even the way you use that passage of the Apostle Paul there's some who will hear that and will say, whoa, wait a minute, you, you've made a connection there that I'm not sure in that time period that Paul would have made that connection. Whoa, wait a minute, you, you have taken that interpretation uh, of what Paul did, but the police system, the government, the structure in America is very different mm -hmm. than what happened at that time. So there's some who will hear that and say, I'm not sure you can make that kind of jump in interpretation. Now, here's what's confusing. They would say that about you and your hermeneutic and your exegesis of that text and make that interpretation. But that same group of people refuse to really take a look and be honest about total depravity when it came to slaveholders. <laughs> they, that, that same group of people would question your interpretation. Yep, yep. Will, will, will not admit that it was horrific yeah. that Jonathan Edwards was a slaveholder. Yeah. It was horrific that church fathers yeah. owned slaves. And they say, well, but no, they were a product of their times. And yeah. you got to be very... Man, I, that's always... See, when we talk about total depravity, absolutely, if you really believe in total depravity, then we would be able to own the full scope of the impact of 200 years of seeing that a people group are not even human. And we would be able to look at people who we read, scholars, church fathers, reformers, etc., and look at them, even countries' founding fathers, and say, they literally thought that people were not human. They literally that, that we had the church that was silent because even when the slave trade ended in the early 1800s, the U.S. continued having more slaves than ever before because now they were breeding slaves. Right. Christians right. were doing that. Right. And then yet Christians would use passages of Scripture to justify that. A misinterpretation of Genesis right. 9. Right. Uh, a misinterpretation, hermetic curse, a, a, a misinterpretation... Uh, taking, very thing that may accuse you doing, taking again uh, Ephesians 6 out of context, slaves obey your masters in doing, and so these same believers will not go back and give an accurate picture mm -hmm. and, act, and even understanding that, you know what, the whole system mm 
of our denomination yeah. has built on something. Not just a few people own slaves and we're sorry for that. Well, no, our whole system was built on the inhumanity of this group of people and we did nothing while the economic system of the U.S. was being built. And we did nothing because we too were afraid because if you don't build the South, and that's the North as well too, so sometimes I get yeah. Christians up North who yeah. want to say, well, this doesn't include us. No, that's, yeah. that's all of us. We again said America can be built off of this system that says this particular people group are not human. And then you even begin to see how it affected our missions. To even this day, you got people who think that Africa is the deep, dark continent. And that somehow I'm doing something extra if I decide to go and be a missionary to Africa. <laughs> and, and those yeah. who would go to Africa didn't come back and bring the truth always. Right that on. you would find people there who didn't fit the Tarzan myth. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so interwoven in everything yeah. that we think and do that it even affect, because you had mission agencies that said that African Americans couldn't go and be a part of these mission agencies and what have you. Then you've got African American people as well who, who said, we can't raise money. I dealt with that in crew. It wasn't that I couldn't raise money, it's that I don't have access to relationships that my other uh, white brothers and sisters have because resources thrive off of relationships whether it's Christian non-Christian right. business period thrives off of relationship right but well, that's great because that that, that says way to the next point where uh, in the article Jamar talks about it's hard to engage people when you're at a 401 level of cultural understanding and they're at a 101 level of cultural understanding or racial awareness mm -hmm. and so when when he said that james white accused jamar and, and even the bd because the bd had uh posted an article yes. tweeted an article from feisty thoughts and uh, that article talked about why i refuse I, why i'm not talking about racial reconciliation but i will talk about white supremacy and so he used a term coined by Vody bacham called ethnic gnosticism this was a term Vody bacham used in his response to Elephant Room 2. And so just, just in case those aren't familiar with what mm -hmm. Gnosticism is, Gnosticism is simply uh, two, two main things. One is dualism, and that is that, the, that matter is evil and the spirit is good. But then the second part is this aspect of having a special uh, amount of knowledge. This idea is uh, it's esoteric in nature. And so when you put them together, ethnic Gnosticism is basically accusing black and brown people of saying that that we, we are the ones that understand black culture and black experience and that you can't say anything. Well, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying that you can't say anything. What he's saying is we don't see the humility to realize that there is some racial ignorance when it comes to the black and brown experience in America. That's just a fact. Right. If you have not walked in my shoes, it's not that you cannot talk, but I know my shoes better because I wear them. <laughs> right? That, that's just the point. That right. if I'm the one wearing them, like I can't talk to my wife not a whole lot about giving birth to a child. Right. I can say something about it. Right. I was even there for both of my children. Right. But I'll never understand it experientially. Right. And so we don't see that same level of humility. Just just whatever's on your heart. How would you enlighten him, but not only Dr. White, because again, this issue is bigger than him. Yeah. But how would you enlighten those that want to accuse black and brown people of ethnic Gnosticism simply because they're confronting their white brothers and sisters out of love. Right, right. Yeah, I, you know, here's the other thing too. Sometimes, and, and, and this is part of our culture, and this is not trying to be anti-intellectual. Yeah. But sometimes we use words in order to move ideas yeah. that people can't relate to and those words begin to empower us to not deal with the root of the conversation yeah. because and the reality is he who controls language controls the conversation yeah and so once again i think sometimes for many of my white brothers and even african americans as well too it does feel strange once again when sometimes people, black people, Asian people, Hispanic people, whatever the group might be that's not the group that typically has power, that sometimes when they begin to use language that appears to be empowering language, mm 
they mean there's a response that we have to that because we're not used to that. So when someone says, you know, again, that I can tell my story and you can't speak to this because you don't know my story, that's empowering language. Well, now, once again, wait a minute, what are you doing? You, you've got authority now that you're placing over me. And rather than encountering the story and encountering the story from a place of vulnerability, then what do we do? We say, no, no, you, what do you, how dare you say I don't understand your story? Well, as I woke up this morning and I turned on the TV, I immediately engaged the world when I opened up my eyes a great deal of vulnerability. Most of the newscasters, most of the perspective of the news did not look like me. Uh, now, there are some news stations that are sensitive to that, and they're right. changing yeah. that. But, but even when I listen to, again, I look at who's navigating power. As I walk into my neighborhood, you know, I have to encounter a whole nother story. As I navigate in my workplace, I have to encounter a whole nother. I have to literally, innately, if I'm going to survive, I've got to make sure I understand the story. That, that's just a given. Right, to the right. point to where my white brothers and sisters feel like, well, we don't have a culture. Because you don't think about it because you're the water. <laughs> you're the water that we all swim in. So, so some of the times when, when we get into this conversation, uh, one of the things is understanding when someone says you can't speak to my story, it's a whole lot deeper than just intellectually speaking to my story. It's saying you don't understand all the nuances that I've got to experience as a black person or Hispanic person that is in the world that I live in every day. You, you cannot possibly understand when you walk into a restaurant and you're the only person that you see in the restaurant who there's no one else who looks like you. You don't understand because you don't think that way. You don't you don't think when you go into a department store. Yeah. You know right. that, you know what I mean? I gotta be on my best behavior here because people and some people say, Well, geez, you're reading into it. Really? The data would say differently. The data news says very differently that we still live in a culture. And again, I agree. Race is a social construct. It doesn't change that it's the construct that we operate in. Right. And as believers, absolutely the goal is to live and create a new construct that we don't go back. But before you do that, there's a lot of things you got to deconstruct before we get to this world where we really don't. Because de- every day, where is, okay, great, if there's a church that doesn't see who I am as a black, great. But 98% of my time is spent in a world where I am still reminded again, day in and day out. So so I think sometimes when people say, you don't understand my story, you can't speak to my story. Well, I think I would say you can speak to it, but be careful because you can't speak with authority over me to my story. It would be great if we can talk to where there's a vulnerability and there's an authority with me. And I think that's what people are responding to is that often when they hear white brothers and sisters, family members say, no, but that isn't the case and that isn't true and well, you're imagining that and how can you say that? Well, then you're using your authority and you're canceling out some things that I experience in my day-to-day life. So I think that's what many people are speaking to when they say, you know what, uh, it's not that you can't speak or you can't be, re- well, no, it's saying, no, you, you, you got to be with me in my soul. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. Well, Pastor James, this has been excellent. I just want, you know, again, this was designed to be compelling, not combative. So I'd just like to know if there are any just, just final thoughts on if you want to speak to him personally or just those that would view this uh, in light of the myriad of topics that we, we covered today. Just any final thoughts you want to share? You know, it's, it's interesting. Here, here's some uh, final things that I, I think I, I want to take an opportunity to say this. And this may, sound, this may sound a little strange, but here I've been thinking here lately about where we are in the time period that we're in. And, and this is going it, to, some of you, if you hear this, you may think that, man, this is just historical. I'm making a huge jump. 
Sometimes I, I wonder if even for those of us, and I'm going to speak primarily to African American, this certainly can, can deal with other ethnic groups as well, but sometimes I wonder if some of the historical dynamics that we have faced out of that 200 years of, of, of slavery are still with us. One of the things that would happen uh, during slave times is you had this separation between the slave that was in the field and the slave that was in the house. And you almost had the slave master intentionally creating a power construct so that there wouldn't be, once again, communication and connection uh, and, and, and as well, they, that separation even of family, separation even of the deconstruction of men and women being in healthy relationships. And so this idea of separation in some ways became embedded within the African-American experience and psyche, which is so contrary to the gospel. You know, I would say to those of us uh, in the time period that we're living in, especially for Christians who are African-American. And I want to make sure that I've got the right position on that language. Here's just a suggestion from one who has been journeying for many years now. One of the things that's frightening for me, that's always been the question, especially for conservative African-American biblical Christians, is why don't we have more unity? Or why is it that you don't see us connecting together? It's almost as if we're afraid that we'll make the wrong statement. Uh, with having unity. And yet, we live in a time period now where I'm excited to be doing, again, this, this experience with an incredible leader and Bible teacher and Pastor Jerome Gay. But I'm excited that he's not the only one. We've mentioned Jamar Tisby, who, again, is doing some things that go beyond what we could ever imagine. Hey, there are a number, again, of African-American women who theologically are on the scene now that are doing some things, shaping some things, that even at the conference where Jamar had, uh, there were some women who really are leading in ways that go beyond. And right now, I'm speaking maybe even to my, some of my own friends and people I know. When I think of Eric Mason, uh, again, doc, Dr. Eric Mason and Epiphany Church and planning uh, other churches doing some incredible things right now. When I think of the Heidi Lewis as well uh, at Blue Pent Church that, that has a legacy that has been incredible right now. When, when I think all across this country you have young African American leaders, when I think of Thabiti Anyabule, Thabiti is one of the brothers now with gray hair who has influenced a number of people who unfortunately, in many interviews, people have tried to set the beady apart so that he could have no voice to speak into his experience as an African-American pastor, and that's tragic. And sometimes I think well-meaning white brothers and sisters, they can do that by, uh, again, giving many of those who I've named platforms for their conferences and everything in a way that would make it seem like that there is no connection that we can have when it comes to speaking specifically and uniquely to issues that influence the African-American community. My hope is that this generation and even the generation to follow will have a level of unity that will speak volumes to, again, the prayers of those from African descent. Because I really believe we are an answer to the prayers of slaveholders and those who were slaves that couldn't even have a voice in moments like this. I also pray that we would use social media with a level of stewardship and that we would use it once again to build one another up because there is a community that is still living, as Langston Hughes says, a dream deferred. And my hope that we wouldn't fall into that and that we would create and make a culture that speaks to the kingdom of God in a way that will be mysterious, in a way that has power. My hope if you're listening to this, that you would understand we're in a critical time period where we can't play the same old narrative that there's a difference between the one in the field and the one in the house. Pastor White, thank you so much. Oh, man, I good to be with you, you my appreciate brother. You. Yes. Dr. White, I'm sure you're familiar with triperspectival interpretation. 
you know, people like Cornelius Van Til, John, John Frame, uh, Richard Pratt, and others are students of Cornelius Van Til's teachings. And he talks about this, uh, John Frame himself talks about this triperspectival approach to interpretation, which first we bring the Bible, the normative perspective. Then we bring our theological tradition, the situational perspective. And lastly, we bring our Christian experience, the existential perspective. This is seen most clearly in Matthew Henry's approach to James chapter 2, verse 2. In James chapter 2, verse 2, James is clearly talking about the issue of favoritism. But Matthew Henry, he goes as far as to say this, but we must be careful not to apply what is here said to the common assemblies for worship. For in these, certainly there are there may be appointed different places of person according to their rank and circumstances without sin. Now, why would Matthew Henry say that? Because of the third component, his Christian experience. Within his tradition, pew purchasing was fine. And so the more money you had, the better seats you got. He's clearly putting his, his Christian experience and his culture above what James says himself. My question for you, Dr. James, is are you doing the same thing? You frequently reference Philippians chapter 2 and what Jamar needs to give up and how there needs to be mutual sacrifice. But the only thing you mention you giving up is the Trinity hymnal. God is calling you yourself to give up more. Yes, Philippians 2 applies to black and brown people and people of all hues, but it applies to you as well. Perhaps you're doing the same thing Matthew Henry is doing, but yet you have not displayed the humility to admit it. You have an opportunity now. Prayerfully, you'll take that opportunity. Thank you.